Amen. Now, as is my custom, I'm going to start and announce it's just what I've done for 20, whatever, 23 years, 24 years. The title of my message before I begin, because that just makes sense. That's what you do. Oh, come on. They already jumped to it. I was, I was going to give a disclaimer before you think that I'm a, a hyper-liberal and that I think uh, I'm going to teach you something about Mother God or something, and we start holding hands and singing Kumbaya around this place. All right? So before you, it's too late, you know, they, they done me wrong. They threw it up there already. Uh, before you jump to conclusions, I want you to see God's Word, and uh, by the end, I believe that you'll be fully convinced and enjoy And it'll lift your heart concerning our Lord God, of his characteristics of his nature, and where our mothers received his image, where that nature was implanted on them. According to statisticbrain.com, which is some very random site on the internet, which I'm sure that you can base all your life upon, according to statisticbrain.com, $671 671 million dollars is spent on just Mother Day Mother's Day cards every year. Just the cards. Hallmark, Hallmark saw that coming, right? 20.7 billion dollars is the total amount spent yearly on mothers on Mother's Day altogether. 20.7 billion dollars. Wow. Now this is the one that's going to blow your mind, okay? This is the one that's going to cause conversations on the way back home today in the car. The average American consumers each will spend on their moms, their mothers, for, for Mother's Day each. How much? Yell it out. How much do you think? How much do they each of them spend on their mothers? Yell it out. What's that? Nobody wants to commit because you're all in trouble. $168.94. The average American spends on their mothers for Mother Day. Listen, some of you mamas are getting ripped off here in the congregation. And you say you need to demand your $168.94, preferably in cash. As Mr. T said, there is no other than your mother. And in the weeks that have led up to Mother's Day, to this message, we don't always, you know, do something very specific for each holiday. I think the Lord has told us to honor our mothers, and I think it's good to have a sermon, have a message from God's Word to kind of gel that. But I've been thinking about a particular verse uh, that's really going to be our springboard this morning, and it's that verse that says, as Jesus is looking over Jerusalem, and he says, Old Jerusalem, Matthew 23, 37, Old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, How often would I have gathered thy children together, and here's the part that I've been meditating on, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not, but ye would not. Let's begin with a word of prayer I'd like to preach to you, the motherly characteristics of God. Heavenly Father, as we look through your word as you have been planted in several places, these characteristics of yourself. I pray, Lord, that they would come to life. Lord, let the word truly live as you said it was a living word. And Lord, you know that I need you. You know this has been a very long week for for several people in here. We need the encouragement of the Holy Spirit who we thoroughly believe in, the third person of the Trinity that comes, as Pastor Pritt just sang about, I have a witness within me. And uh, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would take over the word of God. I pray that you take over the preaching and that you would help me, empower me. I pray as we walk away from this place, we will have met with with God. Lord, please help us. We love you. We cling so gladly to your son, Jesus Christ. You you are everything. You have provided everything that we need in this life. We praise you. We need you. We ask, Lord, that you'll take this service over. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. There are several things to consider in that verse that I just shared with you. Uh, from Matthew concerning uh, Jerusalem, concerning God's perspective, concerning what they were doing, what they weren't doing. But the one thing that sticks out to me here is what Jesus is saying and how he's connecting with the attribute of a mother hen, a mother hen. Mother's Day is huge. It is giant. 
You know, we just read the statistics on that. Father's Day is, well, not so giant. I don't say that to bang on men at all. I just, I just say that to really point out that mothers are very, very particularly special. They have amazing characteristics that stand out and are special to a huge amount. Now, please understand, I totally understand there are bad mothers. I understand that some of you didn't have a mother. I know that some of you struggled concerning whatever, but that is not the norm. And that's not the norm of what we see with most mothers. They're, you know, we're what? Saved and unsaved worldwide. Mothers are extremely special to us. Why are they? What are these characteristics? Where did they come from? And I want to give you a hint. It, it isn't just because of their genes. I don't mean Calvin Klein, okay? It's not just because of their gender. It certainly isn't just because some intuition of nature, tweet, 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 that nature has put in mothers. These amazing characteristics of sacrifice and love and giving and protection and empathy, etc., were first found in their creator and were part of his image before it became a part of their image. Genesis 1.27 says it this way. And by the way, we're going to turn to a passage here in a moment. This is all, you know, intro. Genesis 1.27 says it this way. So God created man in his, or mankind, his own image, in the image of God. Created he him, male and female. Created he them. God made both male and female in his image. And ladies, females bear the image of God in who they are. Maybe you've never thought about that before. I want to be honest with you, before working through it, I didn't really give a whole lot of thought to that either. Those things that are most respected about women and also about mothers are so respected because you can see them mirrored from God's image. They were in him, and he stamped himself, his image on them. Of course, don't get me wrong, don't want bad emails, don't want ugly pictures, you know, left in my office, no dead fish, you know, in newspapers. Of course, we always speak of God as a father. Okay, no one, I will, I'm not challenging that a bit. God always presents himself as a male in scripture, the leadership position, the head and masculine in nature, in the scriptures, through nature, and in, in time, and in our world, even though he is a spirit who really doesn't have a gender. He always presents himself as a male. However, folks, as you read your word of God, we must not miss that God is fully sufficient to us. And here's the deal. In all we need from him. Just as a child needs both father and mother. Amen? Yes? Yes? Okay, that is a biblical truth. Just as a child needs both father and mother, so we need all of the characteristics of, of God as fatherly attributes, and as you'll see in God's word, motherly attributes to form our lives, to conform us to the image of Christ. And that extends to graces that are normally thought of in mothers. Please don't feel weird about this. Don't, you know, whatever, say that pastor's talking about mother God or whatever. We see these motherly characteristics in, in God's word, and I hope this morning you'll embrace them. You'll see several verses overhead where yes, we're preaching expositorily through those verses, but we're hopping from uh, verse to verse concerning topics. They'll be up here, but please also feel free, of course, I encourage you to turn to them in your Bible. So turn to that first passage, please, Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Matthew 23. So let's stand, please, as we read God's word here. Matthew 23, beginning in verse number 37. Beginning and ending in verse number 37. Jesus, in that context of looking over Jerusalem, says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. Sent? From who? Sent from God to thee. 
How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. You may be seated. Jesus is lamenting, you know, in himself, of course, as the Son of God, but in greater way, the Godhead is lamenting over Jerusalem, over Israel. He had, in past history, Old Testament times, for decades, reached out to them. He had sent to show his love, to make the connection of reconciliation and walking with him. He had sent prophets specifically from himself to show him, show them his love. And what did they do? Did they accept his, his messengers? No, they killed them. They rejected the prophets and killed them. And Jesus ends the verse with an allusion to God's broad and gracious willingness. It's an, an allusion of nature, of, of, of animals. Time and time again, he had reached out to them. He wanted to gather them together. And he says, he uses the illustration, I want to I gather you to myself as a mother hen, as a mother chicken, mother hen, gathers her chicks under her wings. That's how I wanted to gather you close to me, near to me. And it says, and you would not, or but you would not. You didn't want to do that. You had no desire to be that close to me. Number one thing I want you to see here concerning the motherly attributes of God is we're going to speak in a moment about a mother's protection later. You know, don't mess with mama bear. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But Jesus here in this verse is really speaking of God's nature of, of being willing to accept and reconcile and draw people near like the picture of this mother hen draws her chicks near. So, of course, what do you got to do when you're preparing a message like this? You got to see it, right? So I went out to my farm. Oh, wait, we don't have a farm. So I went to YouTube, and, uh, which is the next best thing if you don't have a farm. So I went to YouTube, and I, and I watched you know, several videos of, of this going on. And uh, it was really, really pretty awesome. And there was, uh, there was this open barnyard, and there's, there's this hen, and they had, she had all these. I counted 12 or 13, but they wouldn't stand still even if I paused. But they, they kept running around. There's about 12 or 13 of them running around. And uh, she's, you know, they're eating her, and they're eating her, and, they're, and then there's like a noise or something. I don't know what happened in the barnyard. Uh, and then all of a sudden, these little chicks, they run to their mother, and she like pluff, puffs up a little bit, and they're just running in all these access points under her wings. And they just, all of these, all of a sudden, they just all kind of disappear. And there's like a couple just with their eyes sticking out, their little, whatever that's called, uh, beaks, whatever. And they're, she's just like totally encompassing, and they're getting as close possibly as they could. And as I looked at the video, these, they, they were about a quarter of her size, maybe just a little bit less than quarter, and there's like 12 of them, and they all fit. And they all just got up all around and around, and she's just like, you know, hugging them. She held them close to herself as her very own. You know, that's what makes mothers mothers. That's what makes mothers special, or one of the things among many. Some of those chicks in that video as I watched they were healthy and strong, and they were bigger, and some of them were kind of weak. All of the chicks were brown, except one. One was black, the rest were brown. Talk about a bad day, okay? You're the only one. It didn't matter to her at all how strong or how weak those chicks were. It didn't matter to her what color they were. It didn't matter to her at all. None of those. All of them were accepted, welcomed, cuddled, and they were her own special chick. She didn't push away any of them, pulled them close. Mother, the Lord is choosing to give us an illustration of what he wants to do to people who need to be reconciled, like Jerusalem, like Yunzes, like Usens, like the United States. He wants to draw people near. He doesn't want to push them away. He says, I want to be like a mother hen to those who are wandering around, getting all kinds of trouble, whatever. I want to pull them close. That's what good mothers do to their children. This is what Jesus is saying about his willingness, the willingness of the Godhead to draw near to himself, even those who, who have desperately sinned against him, like Israel. It is not coincidence, folks, in this verse that he chooses to remind us, remind us who would read this. He's talking to himself so we could read it later, 2,000 years later, that they had killed the prophets that came to show them his love. I'd reached out to them, and they killed. So what is the Lord saying? How often I want to I still draw you near to me. 
even though you have despised me, even though you have pushed me away. And listen, I'm just going to say this, and I'm planning to say this, but there's mothers in this room this morning that that has been your history with some of your children. And yet there's this incredible God image on you that wants to draw them near to you and forgive them and to reconcile them. It's because of God. He extends his willingness to forgive and reconcile those who have fought against him, those who have sinned against him. He is reaching out to them. We will never reach out to him. We are desperately wicked. We won't do it. And though uh, through dying on the cross for the sin of the world, he has done everything to bring the vilest sinner to be able to come as close as any man can ever bring, get to God. I didn't say that very smoothly, but I want to say it again through what he has chosen to do out of love, and that is killing his son in your place. He has made it possible for you to be that chick, even the offensive one, even the the sinner, the vilest sinner in the room, or the vilest sinner you know. He has made the way for every one of you because of the substitutionary love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ to get as close to him as any person has ever been. You say, that doesn't make sense, Pastor, and, you, and frankly, you don't know what I've done. I know that Jesus Christ's atonement and his love went deeper than the vilest sin in the place. I know that his atonement on the cross and his death, because he was God at dying for mankind, forgives all sin. God wants you to draw near to him like those chicks and the mother hen. As near as those chicks are to the mother hen, so Jesus offers this wonderful truth and what he has done to every man, every woman. He makes a way to draw near to God, come near to God, and calls like a mother hen calling to the world, come near, come near. And some of you you struggle to believe that because your eyes are on your failures and your eyes are on why you shouldn't be able to come near to God. Stop looking at yourself. Look at the nature of God. Do you know? Moms, I do, whose daughters or sons went astray, and though there's every reason not to take them back, every reason, maybe even not even to communicate with them, every reason, a mother can't do that. A mother is, has upon her the same nature and grace and reconciliation of God's character. Perhaps you're here, and the end of verse is about you. But you would not. No thanks, God. I don't want to get close to you like that. No no thanks, God. I don't don't want to admit. I don't want to repent. I don't want to turn away from my sin. I like my own way. I'm going to do my own way. God is saying, don't you see how close I want to draw you to myself? Don't you see, I want to reconcile you. I want to forgive you. I want to change your life. I want to draw you clear so you can walk with me and talk with me. Isn't my way better? Isn't being close to me underneath my wings better than running around in a sinful and very risky life without me? He's not pushing you away because of your offensiveness towards him. No, he's made the way. He's saying, come near. Believe on me. Turn away from that perilous sin and trust in what I have done to make you clean so that you can draw very, 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 very near to me and to your life. For those of you who will not have that, no, I don't really want that. He, he says, how often would I have drawn you near, but you would not. The problem is not with God. God is full of grace and full of mercy and full of love, and I have no idea why, but the Bible says that, and he wants to draw you near. Run to Christ today. Rest under his wings of salvation forever then. You can draw near to him as a chick who's accepted of the mother hen. Drawn very, very close. There's a second thing I'd like you to see about the motherly attributes of God this morning. As a mother with her infant, so the Lord will never forget or forsake his child. As a mother with her infant, so the Lord will never forget or forsake his child. You can turn to Isaiah 49, please. It'll be thrown up on the screen as well. Isaiah 49, In verse number 14, Isaiah 49, 14. So Isaiah 49 says this, But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, 
And my Lord hath forgotten me. I know people right now who have that attitude. I know people right now who are struggling with this lie. Lord's for, forsaken me. Lord hath forgotten me. Verse 15 says, can a woman forget her sucking child? Now let me just tell you, okay? One time I left Abigail at a missions conference at the firehouse, okay? As far as I know, Amy never did. <laughs> you know, mothers may forget that their kid's in the nursery just for, for maybe like two seconds or something like that. This is talking about forsaken. This is like leaving them. You know, it's not natural in any way. There's mental problems if a mother Mothers have this incredible protection inside of them. They're not going to forget, especially about their nursing baby. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she would not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. God is saying it would be more likely that they would forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls, speaking of Jerusalem, the city, are continually before me. Leave this up, guys, during the whole point. Of course, this idea of not forgetting just reminds us of a great New Testament passage that we always quote, that we always say, right? In Hebrews 13, 5b, I will never, yell out, what? Leave thee, nor forsake thee. Okay, this is a continual principle, principle about the nature of God and salvation, He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake his own. This verse is a promise to Israel here in Isaiah 49 of whom we are grafted in salvation. Not all the promises of Israel are ours, but this certainly is. This one goes the whole way till the end of the New Testament to all the children of God, to all who have trusted Christ as Savior, to all who have come to grace in Jesus Christ. There is even, in verse number 16, a post-cross prophecy. Israel says in verse 14, Just like our hearts sometimes say, the Lord has forsaken me. You say, well, pastor, I never thought that. I'm extremely spiritual, and I trust the Lord. And others may think this, but I've never thought that. Are you more spiritual than David, a man after his own heart? You want to go through the Psalms and see how many times that David has alluded to the fact, Lord, have you forsaken me? Do you ever feel like that? I do. You know, I think this body of flesh, which is so given to the world and to the flesh and to every wrong lie, I think this body of flesh and the world that we live in makes it quite normal sometimes for a believer, a child of God, yes, and dwelled with the Holy Spirit, to say, where are you, Lord? Have you forsaken me? We want results. I've got a problem. Lord, you should have, said the an- should have sent the answer yesterday. I want a microwave relationship with God. Instantaneous. We often feel like that, that the Lord has forsaken us, but is that really the reality for the child of God? You know, I, I don't know how many it is. I think it's 365. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's some other statistic. Of times in the Bible that the Bible says, wait on the Lord. Why don't you e- email me? Someone look that up in an email multiple times. You say, the Lord's not, he's forsaken me at this moment. Wait on the Lord. He will not forsake you. This gets his character. He can't do it. What is the reality of the child of God? God asks, can a woman in the verse, look at the words, Isaiah 49, 14, 15, 16, can a woman forget her sucking child that's a very young infant? Will a mother fail to have compassion on her young baby? The answer is no, of course not. Of course that could never happen. As I look around at some of you mothers and I have seen how you react with your children, how you love your children, it's it's ludicrous to think. This is who the Lord, the Lord is comparing himself to this mother, to this mother that would never forget her child. The normal uh, bond between a mother and and her baby is perhaps the very strongest bond known to mankind. That's another great thing about mothers. They bond so strongly with their babies and that bond continues even in the language of, you got to get this, older or aged mothers who still at family reunions refer to all their babies coming home. Their babies who have grandchildren of their own. My babies are coming. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? My babies are coming home. 
That's why we love our mothers. Because of this bond that is unbreakable, unshakable. This compassionate bond for their children. Well, have you ever thought about where they get that characteristic? From God. It's the image of God upon them. Notice the verses. God says in verse 15, the last part, the mother may forget her infant, but I will not forget thee. It's stronger. (laughs) Praise the Lord. I need to hear this. His loyalty and faithfulness to you, child of God, is stronger than the bond of a mother and her infant baby. It would be more likely that she would fail to have compassion on that little baby than God failing That's good stuff. He compares his loyalty and faithfulness to the strongest human bond and says, my loyalty to you is even stronger. The mother may fail the infant. I'll never fail you. But oh, how sometimes it feels like it. How sometimes our failing faith would listen to the serpent's lie. But just like verse number 14, those doubts, we would want to listen to the hissing sound of the serpent. But hear the word of the Lord, his children. God will never, never, never forget or forsake or fail you. His compassions will never fail his children. Never. Some of you need to scream that in the darkest of night. And the evil one would lie to you. Why, pastor? How can you say that imperatively? How can you say that? that that, Well, for one thing, the word of God just said it. But I'm going to give you a reason. Verse number 16, I have graven thee upon the the palms of my hand. And God uses this to show you why he will never forget you or never fail you. The etymology of this saying, perhaps in Israel this meant something. Some people said, people wrote like Bible verses or even pictures uh, were marked, pictures of the temple were like marked on their hands or whatever so they could always walk around appreciating. So maybe there's an etymology of history. It is lost. The only thing that remains is the great puff prophecy at this point of the future of what would happen on the cross and the the beautiful hands of Jesus Christ that would receive nails that would forever remind him at the right hand of God with him and his father that you are graven on his hands he has written you he has died for everyone in the room and he has graven you on his hands and your salvation and your justification and your redemption and your incredible secure place in Jesus Christ with God the Father as royal children heirs of all things heirs with Jesus Christ how could he ever 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 forget it he looks over at the son at the right hand and there you are graven on his hands there you are he never never will forget you you are ever present in his presence by his high priest who is always continually making intercession for you. That's some shouting stuff. Change the sign from Baptist to Pentecostal. That's some great stuff. God is like the mother who will never let you go or forsake or forget a child of salvation. Number three, I'd like to share with you another motherly attribute of God. As a mama bear robbed of her cubs, so the Lord is protective of his own. As a, a mama bear, how many of you are familiar with that saying, mama bear? How many of you women, you can become a mama bear? How many of you men ever saw your wives? Beca- no, don't do that, all right? You gotta just say all nice things. See, it's an interesting thing. You can preach like, really, you can just rip men apart on Father's Day. Y'all don't read this kind of father. You guys get out of the ditch. I can't believe you're not teaching your children, nurturing them up. On Mother's Day, you're like, everyone is so sweet in the room. You mothers, I love you so much. You're actually gonna hear a sermon this Father's Day that is a great encouragement to fathers. So a very a great praising to fathers. But you gotta wait for that. As a mama bear robbed of her cubs, so the Lord is protective of his own. Hosea 13, verse number 4 says it this way. Okay, we're going to work through this and 
Pete, I want you to go back to the verses as I refer to them. It says, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God, little g, but me, for there is no Savior beside me. Wow, that's great truth. There's no Savior beside me. I did not, uh, I did not know thee in the wilderness, or excuse me, I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. Verse 6, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled, and their heart was exalted. Therefore have they forgotten me. It got too good for them, and they forgot the Lord. Verse 7, therefore I will be unto them as a lion. As a leopard, by the way, will I observe them. Okay, it's a term of stocking. Leopard, lion. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps. That's a mama bear with her cubs. And will rend the call, that is, that is a word for chest cavity, of their heart. And there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. So you've heard the term mama bear. Did you ever know where it came from? This is the verse it comes from. Mama bear. Most mothers will be pushed all just so far. But when you begin messing with their children, you should expect the same fury as a mama bear robbed of her, robbed of her cubs. And some of you know how to be mama bears, all right? Some of you have never seen Amy as a mama bear. But uh, my children will testify, you don't mess so far with her children. She knows how to be a mama bear. So you better just back off, brother. We love our mothers because of this. We love our mothers because they are very protective of us. We may not like it when we're, we're very young, all right? So the kids are in junior church, most of the youngest ones, but we don't appreciate that when they're very young, we, when, we're, when we're very young. But when we get older, we like it. When we're very young and they say, better wear a coat. By the way, have you noticed that young people don't wear coats anymore? It's lost, which is another reason that technology is bad somehow. They stop wearing coats. They, don't just, they just don't wear coats. I mean, like 40 degrees, 30 degrees outside. They don't, there's no such thing. You can't even buy a winter coat, I don't think, for a kid anymore. It's just, there's no point of them. They just don't wear them. They won't wear them. It's sin. It's the slippery slope of our, of our country. Maybe your mother said, uh, you know, don't do something dangerous. You stop walking, walking on that fence, Junior. You better get down from there. Or maybe a friend that was a bad influence on you. My mother never held back when she talked about friends that she didn't think was a very good influence on me. One time I brought a girl home. For a, it was just high school. We just brought a girl home. And from the moment that girl got in the door, it was, it was really weird. I want to just be honest with you. It was really weird. When she, I thought she was fine at school. But when she got into the shadow of my godly mother, it was like horns came out on that girl. I mean, it's just like I, I could see right through her, and she just seemed so fake and so plastic. From the moment she came into the door, I could tell my mother's displeasure. And the problem was, even as like a junior in high school, I knew she was, I knew my mom was right. So maybe you don't like those times. Somebody sketchy that, you're dating that they don't approve of <coughs> James Wentworth. Oh, sorry. I know. <laughs> I had to do it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's my. No, he's a good fella. We think. That's what we're testing out and stuff. <laughs> Maybe the lecture your mama gave you about the direction of your life that she didn't really appreciate. She warned you that the bridge is out ahead. You didn't want to hear that. Mothers are very protective. It's amazing as you. You get older, Mr. Rudy, how much you realize how wise your mother was. And how nearly everything she said seemed to be to come from the wisdom of God. You know, God is like that mama bear in his protective way. The Psalms are full of the promises of God that he is our shield and our fortress and our defense, our hiding place, our defender. If you ever question his protection of your life, 
jot on the corner of whatever notes you're taking or not taking, Psalm 18. It's been a blessing to me where the psalmist cries out to the Lord and the Lord hears him from heaven and sends forth uh, a power, comes down, the scripture says, and shakes the earth to defend his child. Okay, don't tell me the Lord isn't interested in your protection, Psalm 18. That is our protecting God who acts as a mama bear. However, that is not really at all what this passage is talking about when it talks about a mama bear. So stare at the passage again. This is speaking, when he says I'm like a mama bear, I am like a mama bear who's been robbed of her cubs. This is speaking of the majority of Israel in the wilderness that were faithless after he brought them out of Egypt. And they were full of pride and they liked everything that the world had to offer. And so they became fat and they turned away from the Lord. They turned away from their God who could help them. And God says he observed them as a lion and a leopard that is stalking, that is in the grass, the tall grass, is stalking them. So he watched them being filled. The more they were filled with their eyes on the gods of little g of this world, the less they cared about him. And as he had stalked them like a leopard and a lion, then he chastened them, check it out, with the full fury of a mama bear who is robbed of her whelps, of her cubs. This speaks of protection, all right, the protection of a God that is willing to chasten his children so he could help them. A God that is willing to discipline and to bring his children back even though it may bring great pain. Some of you had mamas that tanned your hide. Others of you have no idea what that means. Well, you ought to have known what that means. I'll just tell you that. You had mamas, some of you had mamas that had to be both mama and father to you. You should thank God for that mama that wouldn't let you just get by with whatever you wanted to do. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say young parents here, listen. I'm just going to throw this in. This is all free. You know, there is no, there is no discussion. There is a discussion against angry Corporal punishment being wrong. There is no discussion in the word of God that disciplining, that corporally punishing, that spanking your child in a consistent and a controlled way is not the very word of God. It is. And for decades and decades, parents under control and correctively and with the wisdom of God have disciplined their children and there was great morality and life change and life direction from seeing that sin or that rebellion brings pain. And then all of a sudden, somewhere in the 20th century, in the night, yeah, 20th century, Dr. Spockism and all that garbage started saying that spank your children's bad for them. What? You better correct God because the, the Bible uses corporal punishment as an example of God who chastens his own children whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth and he scourges every son whom he receives and if you don't have chastening from God when you go astray in your life and you can live in sin month after month after month then the Lord uses a very strong word and calls you bastards you're not my child I love my child I discipline my child and parents listen if you love your child you will discipline them also that's what the Word of God says. There's no, there's no debate. It's not up for debate. Any more than the definition of marriage or something like that's up for a day. It's not up for a day. It's what the Lord says. I'm sorry, I kind of went off on that. Some of you had mamas who would get in your face. She'd get a hold of your arm or your ear or your bottom and say, boy, you ain't, you're not going to live like that. You're not going to do that in my house. I won't have it. You weren't raised in a barn. How many of you heard that saying? You weren't raised in a barn. I was very sure when I was you know, 18 years old and I left my house that I wasn't raised in a barn. I knew that. I'm not, you're not going to live like an animal around here. Praise the Lord for godly mothers that would chasten their children when they were out of line. Oh, so much wisdom that mother had. But How much more wisdom does God Almighty have who acts as this mother bear to protect his children from themselves? He says at the end of the passage, you're destroying yourself. Throw it up there again, boys. He says, you're, you're destroying yourself. And I am your help, I, but I will be your help. 
how, how wise God is to chasten you and to correct you and to patiently and consistently bring pain and pressure into your life to sanctify you and make you like Jesus Christ. He's not going to stop. You say, I wish things would just stop happening in my life. I wish there would just not be problems, start bringing pains. Well, if you'd like the Lord to stop loving you, then keep on praying and thinking that way. But to the end of your life, we're going to endure pressure and pain because the Lord is conforming us to the image of Christ. And chastening is good for his children. Praise the Lord for his protective hand and discipline to bring us back on track. God is like a mama bear. As we lay on the plane this morning, I would love to have, if I had time, to take you to passages like Isaiah 66 and show you how God cares for his own and comforts them in his attribute, the Bible says, like a mother comforts her baby. And there are other passages that we could go to to see that's motherly characteristics of God that is implanted, that, is, that, is, uh, that women are, are made in the image of God. But I want to leave you with a very powerful last point. It's point number four. Like a teaching mother, like a teaching mother, God leads us to what is best for our lives. Like a teaching mother, God leads us to what is best for our lives. So, so take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. So I want you to see verse number one through six when you get there, and then we're going to hop down to 10 and see his motherly attributes. This sounds like a psalm uh, when it's, uh, as it's written, Deuteronomy 32. It's a song of Moses. Deuteronomy 32. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as rain, as the rain. My speech shall Your page is still, it's Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, and as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, doesn't it sound like you're reading in Psalms? He is the rock, his his, uh, work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his, of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Do, do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath brought, bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Now jump down to verse number 10. He found thee in a desert land and in the waste howling desert or excuse me, wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Now look at this. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings. Here's this motherly eagle. Taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, and see that eagle soaring up to the high places, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, and then it goes on to tell them what God has done for them. In this passage, you know, by the way, some other translations translate eagle, you know, in the uh, Hebrew is always a masculine word, even, even mother eagle, it's always a, a male word, a masculine word, the grammar. So some mistranslate this as a a father eagle. It is not a father eagle by the nature of of what she is doing here. This passage is like a psalm. It is praising God for his graciousness to his people. It's rebuking his children that turn away from him. But verse 10 through 13 are especially precious. In verse number 10, he begins speaking of the Lord's leadership to his people. You know, God leads us. He led, the verse says. He instructed. Then verse number 11 begins comparing God to this mother eagle. So I began researching. I get these rabbit trails going in my office where I began researching, going on to eagle sites, scientific, you know, eagle sites, whatever, and starting learning about eagles. And, you know, if if God refers to it, you know, we need to know at least a little bit about it. I began researching the behavior of, of eagles and how they teach their eaglets to fly. So first she stirs up the nest and gets them knowing that something's happening. 
And then she branches. That's an official word. If you, know, if you ever meet like an eagle guy and you want to sound like really, really smart, you just say, you know, I was considering the branching of eagles. Stop right there, though. He's going to find you out. <laughs> she branches in their sight, which means that she stands on a close branch in their eyesight, and she flaps her mighty wings. She doesn't fly. She doesn't take off anywhere. She just flaps it. It's called branching. She teaches them the motion over and over and over, fluttering, as the verse says, over them with her broad wings. And then those little eaglets, they go through this process called fledging. Their, their wings, or excuse me, their feathers are, are getting stronger, are changing to, to flying feathers. And they too start out by branching beside her to try out their wings like mama has done. I saw mama do this, and I'm going to do this. The phrase in the verse, uh, beareth them on her wings, is not what you think. So don't be an, an ignorant Christian who says something like, you know, eagles carry around their eaglets on their back or catch them when they're flying. That is, they don't do it, and that's not what the Lord means here. An eagle never carries or catches her eaglets on her wings. This word beareth is more likely figurative of encouraging her eaglets by teaching them how to fly, by branching, by encouraging, by teaching, so that they would do what she has done before. The eagle, the Lord, the scripture says, verse 12, alone, and verse 13, teaches them to ride on high places. So they can be way up in the air, and you can YouTube some videos on this too, they can be way up in the air. And then they will plunge, they will dive at over 100 miles an hour and pick up the best rodents, pick up what other birds could not pick up what other fox could not chase down. They fly on high places so that they may get the best stuff from the fields. You know, that's what we love about mothers. They've always been teaching us and leading us to what is best for our lives. Okay, that's not some cool wordplay. That's these verses. They've always been teaching us wisdom of how to live and godly mothers have been teaching us how to seek God. Do you know why I get up and read my Bible in the morning before I plunge into the day? It's not because of some great discipline or not because I have a job as a pastor. It's because I saw my parents doing it. And I saw my father who would go downstairs at 5.30 in the morning and would open his Bibles and up through the heating registers, I could hear him cry out to God for his children. And that made incredible impact on me. And I can see my mother by the front door in our living room sitting on that wing-back chair and opening her old Schofield Bible and reading under the plant light that was growing plants there beside the front door. And she was every day going to the Lord. She was teaching me, though she didn't even know it. She was branching and f stretching out her strong wings of how you fly in this world. You fly in this world by getting with God before the day starts. By the example of their wings, our mothers have taught us to pray, to sacrifice, and to love and to care, to be what we would never have been without them. The example of honesty and integrity that we would have never had. I say to that, thank you so much, mothers. Thank you for showing us your wings so that we could fly. And so God, because that comes from his nature, so he does with his, his children. His ways are perfect. He says, be ye holy for I am holy. I will show you what I am. I will show you my son. I will send him to the earth to live so that you know how to fly. You look at him. You look at him branching. And you branch, and then you fly to be the believer you ought to be, the child of God you ought to be. The example of his son constantly leads us to be what we would never otherwise be, like a mother. God is for us. He is always for us. He is always teaching us how to live the best in this life. He is refining us. He is perfecting us. He is showing us what he looks like, just like this mother eagle. And frankly, sometimes that wears us out. We don't think we can fly like that. And yet there he is teaching us. It is always for our best. We should say thank you God for showing us your wings so that we could fly. Teaching us what you're like. Today is a very special day. It's Mother's Day. To the mothers here today we say thank you very much. We value you. We respect you. All these words are trite. 
for the decades that you took to comfort us and to be like us and to show us really the image of God. We appreciate you. Do not think that your labor is vain, mothers. Don't give up, mothers. Keep branching in front of us. We'll follow you. We're hearing you. We do appreciate all you do. We do recognize that you are unlike, as the video said at the beginning, anyone else in our lives. We also recognize that we're not here to worship mothers, but we realize that you mothers are that way because there is a heavenly God and you're made in his image and he does have these motherly characteristics. He has engraved his characteristics upon you and for that we say, thank you Lord. There is no one else like you, both a father and yes, the characteristics of spiritual mother to us. Would you bow your heads, please?